Hello everybody and uh, welcome to the third and final webinar in our current series of um, property dispute uh, resolution webinars. Um, today's topic is uh, avoiding disputes when serving notices under property contracts. Um, I'm joined today by my colleague uh, Stephanie Hepburn um, and uh, we're going to be um, looking in particular at three recent judgments of the, the Scottish Appeal Court, uh, which uh, we think provide um, some useful examples uh, of some of the issues which can arise uh, with notices which are served under, uh, under property contracts um, and show how, uh, in general, the court will approach the exercise of determining whether or not uh, the notice is valid. And, and we hope that by looking at those cases that there are perhaps some key messages that can be derived, some, some key things to bear in mind uh, with a view to avoiding uh, these sorts of disputes. So, um, just a, a few kind of initial comments before uh, turning to the first case, the Western Bartonshire uh, Council case that was mentioned on the last slide. Um, one of the key principles which, which I think can be taken from, from, from the case law relating to notices, uh, and one which is um, uh, which is, which is clear from the Western Bartonshire case, um, is, is that there is a distinction between errors uh, in a notice uh, or, or in the, the delivery of a notice, the service of a notice, which fail to meet the requirements of the relevant contract uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, errors in the content um, of the notice. Um, now, that, that is a distinction which was made in uh, one of the leading cases uh, on notices from back in 1997, the House of Lords decision in Manai Investments against Eagle Star uh, Life Assurance uh, Company. Um, and um, essentially the distinction is that if, if a, a, an error is an error which fails to meet the requirements of the contract, then that will invalidate your contract. Although, as we will come on to see, in light of some recent case law in Scotland, that might not always be the case, but in general, if uh, an error fails to meet the requirements of the contract, then that will in invalidate it. Whereas, um, if, if a notice does meet the, the requirements for, for validity in the contract, then it might, an error in the content of the notice, might not invalidate it. Um, now, that will depend on what is referred to as, has come to be re referred to as the reasonable recipient test. And Stephanie will come on to talk about that a little bit later uh, in the webinar. Um, but as far as the first type of error is concerned, failure to meet the requirements of the contract, um, Western Barnshire Council is a good example of that. But just before we go into that, I thought it might be useful to have a look at a couple of quotes from two of the judges, um, two of the House of Lords judges that, um, uh, that gave judgments in the Manai Investments case. Uh, the first from Lord Goff um, says, the agreement between the parties provides what notice has to be given to be effective to achieve the relevant result. The question in each case is, does the notice which was given properly construed comply with the agreed specification? If it does, it's effective for its purpose. If it doesn't, it's not so effective. And the mere fact that the person serving the notice plainly intended and was trying to give an effective notice under the clause and that the recipient of the notice realized that he was doing so makes no difference. This is because the notice properly construed did not comply with the agreement between the parties. The key does not fit the lock so the door will not open. And another quote uh, from Lord Hoffman, if the clause had said the notice had to be on blue paper, it would have been no good serving a notice on pink paper, however clear it might have been that the tenant wanted to terminate the lease. I think those, those quotes are quite useful, I think, in, in, in providing a sort of clear, the, that, that idea that, um, that a notice has to meet the requirements uh, of the contract. Now, we're talking here about requirements of the contract, but I think it's worth mentioning that there may be other documents uh, as well with which the notice has to comply. For example, there may be a relevant statute with which the notice has to comply. Um, and a, 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 you know, a clear example there would be a, a notice under a commercial lease, a notice of irritancy, um, where there are statutory provisions uh, which have to be complied with when serving a, an irritancy notice, as well as complying with the provisions of the lease. Now, as far as irritancy notices are concerned, I would say there is, um, you know, I, I, I would urge anybody to take advice before, uh, before serving an irritancy notice. But I just mention this to say that, um, obviously, compliance with the contract uh, is, is vital, um, but bear in mind that there may be other documents. For example, there may be legislation which also has to be complied with. Now, turning to the Western Berkshire Council case, I'd say this is a, 
a useful example, I think, of a case um, where the court ultimately determined that um, the, the, the server of the notice had failed to comply with the party's contract it involved a rent review notice, um, which was um, served by uh, the landlords, um, but it was incorrectly addressed, as you'll see on the slide there, to uh, William, abbreviated Thompson and Sons Limited, rather than the name of the tenant, which was William Thompson and Sons brackets Dumbarton uh, Limited. Um, now here, the, 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 it was found that the notice was in fact received by the tenants, um, it, it went to the right address, uh, and indeed it was opened by one of their directors. So um, they certainly had, they received the notice, they had knowledge of what the notice was saying. Nevertheless, the court um, held that the notice had failed to meet the requirements of the lease and that it was invalid on that basis. Now, the reason for that is that the rent review clause, or the, the, the relevant part of the rent review clause, um, provided that notice had to be given to the uh, tenants as defined, and, and the court held that that hadn't been done here. Notice had been given to um, to peer at well, in the case of it, a different company. Also, the, the service, the notices provision of the lease provided that um, uh, any notice of tenants had to be duly addressed to the tenants as defined. Now, what the court uh, determined here was that those were um, requirements of the contract between the parties, the lease between the parties. They hadn't been complied with, and therefore, um, this was a case where um, the, 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 the notice had been invalidated. Now, as we'll come on to see, there was a recent decision of the Scottish Courts which perhaps cast some doubt on that decision, but I say I think it, it provides a clear example of a case where um, the, 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 we stipulate some requirements and, and, and it shows what can happen if those requirements are not strictly uh, complied with. Um, but if your notice does comply with the requirements, then, as I said, if there is an, if there is an error in it, then it might nonetheless uh, be um, valid. And I'll hand over to Stephanie now uh, to talk about that and to look, about, to, to, to look at the next case in our list. So as Dan has mentioned, <coughs> it's a basic rule that any requirements for the service of notices, whether contractual or statutory, must be strictly complied with. To mitigate against what some might see as the harshness of this rule, um, the House of Lords, <coughs> as it then was, developed a principle called the Manai Principle, under which, in certain circumstances, defects in a notice will not actually invalidate that notice. So what is the Manai Principle then? It's really just a, a reasonable recipient's test, whereby minor defects in unilateral contractual notices will not necessarily invalidate the notice if the reasonable recipient, with knowledge of the factual and contextual background in the circumstance of, of, of the case, would not be perplexed, and that was the word used in the case, perplexed by the error. The principle arose from the case of Manai Investments against Eagle Star, a shoeless company limited, and concerned a break clause in a lease. In terms of clause 713 of the lease, the tenants had the right to break the lease by serving not less than six months notice in writing, which was to expire on the third anniversary of the term commencement date. There wasn't a formal requirement in, in the lease that the notice specified the actual date of termination itself, um, and the tenant went on to serve a break notice, which was actually expressed to be pursuant to clause 713. And the notice says the termination date was 12th January 1995, uh, but the third anniversary date that should have actually have been stated was 13th of January 1995, so the date in the notice was incorrect. But the House of Lords held that notice was actually effective. They decided that even though there was an error in the notice, it was actually otherwise clear and unambiguous and didn't leave the landlord in any doubt or reasonable doubt as to the tenant's intention, what it actually wanted to do by serving the notice. The fact that the notice was actually expressed to be pursuant to clause 712, so referring it back to the actual break clause in the lease, meant it was plain that the tenant actually wanted to invoke that break. Further, the court also said the landlord would be expected to know the terms of the lease and also to know the date on which the lease felt to be determined. And the landlord would also be expected to know there was no formal requirement for a tenant to specify the notice 
the actual termination date, um, as I've mentioned in the leaf. <clears throat> there wasn't really any evident reason why the tenant selected to, to put the 12th as opposed to the 13th, the correct date, um, but the court went on to say the close proximity of the 13th to the 12th made it more evident that it was simply some sort of error or even a typo, and the date intended was the date agreed under, under the provision in the lease. And what the, the, the test really is, and what the court said in, in this Manai case, was a reasonable recipient who has the knowledge um, of the terms of the lease and the anniversary date would have been left in no doubt that the tenant wanted to, to determine the lease on the 13th of January 1995, but had just wrongly described it as the 12th of January. So in the context of the case, and looking at that, those case the facts and circumstances of that case, it was right to adopt a sort of commercially sensible approach um, to the interpretation of the notice on the basis that would most likely give, give effect to the party's uh, intention. So looking now at a recent case um, which has followed this reasonable recipient test, uh, Tycho Fire and Integrated Solutions against Regent Key Developments. This case isn't about the effective service of a blatant the, the, the distinction that Dan mentioned. In this case, there wasn't a dispute about the form of validity of the notice. In terms of the lease, didn't have to be in a, a special form, and it was served on time in this case. What this case was actually about was how a reasonable recipient of the notice would have understood it to, to, to have meant, given some errors that were contained within the actual body of the letter itself. Tyco were tenants of commercial premises in the retail park in Aberdeen. The lease was originally for two units, units three and four, in, in this, this retail park, and was for a period of ten years. Um, there was a break, break option, it spreads up to five years, and in 2011 the parties varied the lease um, to include a further additional unit, so unit one was included uh, as part of the, the premises. They extended the term of the lease to 2021 and also included a new break option which was exercisable by the tenant five years after the effective date which was set out in the minute of variation and on giving six months notice. In January 2016, the tenant served a break notice. They gave the required six months notice, so that was fine, but the heading of the letter which contained the, the break notice referred only to units three and four and not to the traditional unit unit one. This by heading what I mean is the heading in bold underneath the dear sirs part of the break notice, but before the body of the letter actually began. And the heading defined units three and four for the purpose of the notice as the premises in inverted commas. The first paragraph of the actual body of the letter defined the lease by reference to the original lease only, as opposed to the lease as varied by the minute of variation. The landlord tried to argue that these were two errors which had a cumulative effect of rendering the notice ineffective. They said the tenant had tried to exercise a break option over units three and four only, and not unit one, which it wasn't entitled to do in terms of the lease. Both parties agreed that a valid notice must be sufficiently clear and unambiguous to leave a reasonable recipient in no reasonable doubt as to how and when it's intended to operate. But the issue is really one of, one of interpretation. How would a reasonable recipient with the knowledge of the facts and circumstances and terms of the lease in this case have understood the notice? And the landlord said that if you applied the reasonable recipient test in Manai, a reasonable recipient may have been confused by the notice, and if that was the case, this was sufficient to invalidate it. And what they tried to say, quite interestingly, was there was a real possibility the tenant may well have misunderstood what the extent of its power to actually exercise the break option was, and had in practice tried to break, um, serve a break in respect of just Unit 3 and 4 and not Unit 1. And they said, because of that possibility, the notice was confusing and ambiguous to a reasonable recipient. Not surprisingly, I don't think, the court rejected the landlord's arguments and granted the declarator that the notice was valid. They looked at the, whole, the notice as a whole and the court said no reasonable recipient would be misled into interpreting the notice as being only in relation to units 3 and 4. 
the court was satisfied that the reasonable recipient would not have been perplexed in any way by the error in the letter heading. The operative element of the notice, which is the body of the letter itself, was sufficiently clear and unambiguous to avoid any such perplexity. The landlords did appeal to the inner house of the court of session, but the, they upheld the original decision. The inner house said it was satisfied that any ambiguities and doubts that the landlord was trying to present were, in a sense, theoretical, as opposed to ones that in reality would actually have existed in the mind of the la reasonable landlord at the time. And they said that no reasonable landlord in the circumstances would have been misled by the error in the heading and perhaps the careless use of the definition of the lease in the body of the letter. <clears throat> I think, though, while it's important to say that every case will turn its own facts and circumstances, and we'll come on to that a bit more later, um, what this case makes it clear is that minor errors will not usually undermine an otherwise valid notice. Um, clearly, obviously, we do want accuracy in the drafting of, of course, any correspondence, not least formal entities. But it's important to, to remember the courts will not normally allow a technical inaccuracy to have a bearing on the validity of a notice that is otherwise valid, as long as the intention is clear. And it all comes back to that intention. What would the reasonable recipient have understood the intention to be of, of the notice? And we'll come on to talk about more practical tips um, at the end. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. Um, just briefly, before turning to look at the, the, the third final case on our, our list, I just want to mention, if anybody has any questions that they want to ask, then please use the chat facility to do that. If we've got time um, at the end, then uh, we may be able to pick up on one or two questions. But uh, if not, we are happy to get in touch with anybody who does uh, um, have any questions. Now, Turning now to um, the, the last case on our list, the most recent one, which is a, a Scottish appeal court decision from um, February uh, last year. This was a dispute about the validity of a notice which was served under a shared purchase agreement, so not a property contract, but um, the decision is important uh, in relation to uh, notices under contracts generally and some of the principles uh, which the court uh, discussed uh, in the judgment. Uh, uh, apply uh, as, as equally to um, property contracts as we do to um, contracts such as a share purchase agreement, which was the subject of this action. Um, it's a case actually in which uh, Shepherd and Wedderburn acted for uh, the, the defenders um, the, who are the sellers under the share purchase agreement. Um, the, the notice was a, a notice of claim which was served by the purchasers uh, on the sellers under the, the, the share purchase agreement. Um, and the validity of the notice was challenged broadly on two grounds. Um, the first ground um, was that the notice contained um, insufficient information about the claim uh, in terms of the share purchase agreement. Now, I don't propose to say too much, uh, well, I don't propose to say anything about that ground. Um, the, 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 the facts uh, around that are, are particular to the share purchase agreement in question. What is important, I think, from the perspective of a property contract uh, and, and notices under property contracts is the second ground, which was which related to, uh, again, moving back to um, compliance with the contract. It was around the, it was about the method by which the notice um, was served. Um, what the agreement provided was that um, the notice had to be sent to the seller solicitors at a specified address and marked for the attention of a specified person. Uh, and in the, uh, as far as method of delivery was concerned, it had to be personally delivered or sent by first class post or recorded delivery. Um, the notice was in fact sent by uh, DX, which as, as many of you will know is a, um, a, a document delivery uh, service um, which is used commonly by solicitors in the place of, um, instead of the Royal Mail, um, for delivery of documents. Um, so it was addressed to the firm's VX address rather than their postal address, which was specified in the contract, and it was not marked for the attention of the specified person. So, as I say, the um, the purchaser, um, the, sorry, the sellers argued that the um, the notice was not valid um, because. Um, the agreement didn't allow for service by, by DX. That wasn't one of the permitted uh, methods of service. Um, and also because it wasn't marked for the attention of a specified person in the contract. And uh, it, wasn't, uh, it didn't contain a specified address. It didn't have the postal address um, of the firm. Now, 
at first instance, um, the judge agreed with the sellers on that. Um, and uh, you'll remember one of the quotes from one of the earlier slides from the Manai Investments case. Um, and uh, echoing that quote, the judge uh, stated that the purchasers had failed to use the right key and accordingly the lock will not turn. Now that seemed to me and it seems to many other uh, lawyers to be consistent with previous decisions um, and consistent with the approach uh, that's, that was taken in Manai and, and in cases uh, subsequently. But um, on appeal, um, the inner house uh, of the court of session held that in the circumstances of the case, the notice was valid. Now, that might seem odd, um, as I say, given uh, the, the sort of case law that we've been discussing up until now, and, and, and you might be thinking, well, how does that fit with the, the Western Bartonshire Council case? And um, come on to, to have a look at that um, briefly. But I thought it would be useful to just run through what the, the, the court's reasoning was uh, in deciding that um, the notice uh, was valid. Now, um, in looking at the sort of general principles which apply in, in relation to the requirements of contractual notice, the court uh, commented that um, contracts, including leases, um, you know, will, will frequently contain provisions that authorise the giving of a notice, either to bring about a particular legal, legal result or give notice of an event. Um, and the court commented that two distinct types of question may arise. The first, the terms of the notice might itself be an issue. Are the terms sufficient to convey the necessary information to the recipient? There you're getting into the sort of tenant territory of the, the sort of Manai Investments reasonable recipient uh, test. The second distinct type of issue that might arise is that the method of giving the notice might be an issue. Has the notice been issued in accordance with the contractual provisions that govern the sending of the notice? Here we're into the sort of that other category of case, does it comply with the contract? Now, the approach of the court was to really to apply some general principles relating to contractual interpretation, and there's a lot of discussion in the judgment about recent case law relating to contractual interpretation and how that applies when looking at whether a notice is valid. Now, unfortunately, we don't have time to get into that today. Um, what I do want to um, have a look at, obviously, um, is um, the court's um, uh, how the court approached the exercise of determining whether or not the requirements of this contract had been complied with, particularly in relation to uh, the method of service. Um, now, one comment I think is the court made that is worth bearing in mind uh, is that um, you know, the court noted that there is quite a lot of case law relating to, to notices, and uh, in, when the hearing took place, the court was referred to quite a number of previous decisions. Um, but the court commented that the traditional approach of Scots law, as opposed to English law, is based on principle rather than analogy. So the court was of the opinion that it's more important to determine the underlying principles that should govern the validity of contractual notices rather than the details of individual cases. Um, the, the, the court noted that individual cases will generally turn on the particular form of contract that is an issue and that that's not necessarily a helpful guide to other forms of contract. But in terms of going about how to decide um, whether a, a notice is complied with the requirements of, of, of the contract. The court stated that as a matter of principle, the crucial question is normally whether strict compliance is required, strict compliance uh, with one or more requirements of the clause that empowers the sending of the notice. Um, the court went on to say that in determining that question, that the ordinary principles of in interpretation of contractual contracts are applicable. So regard must be had to the terms of the relevant clause which must be interpreted in the context of the document where it's found in the general contractual context, and the requirement must be given a pur purposive construction. And the court also commented that where appropriate commercial common sense should be applied. If you're familiar with some of the recent cases uh, around uh, contractual interpretation, some of those principles will be familiar to you. The court then commented that in this area, the need for a purposive construction appears to be particularly important. And the court noted in particular that it may be said that the more drastic the consequences of a notice, the greater the need for strict compliance with what is prescribed in the contract. So a notice might bring about a fundamental alteration in the party's legal relationship, such as a break clause and a lease, which brings the contract to an end. Uh, now that would be at the sort of more drastic end of the scale. The court said, well, a range of less drastic notices can also be found. For example, a notice submitting a dispute to arbitration or adjudication. Now, the court noted that in this case, the HOE International case, the notice in, in dispute was a notice um, intimating a pending claim by a third party. And the court commented that that can be regarded as an issue that is at the lower end of the scale of importance. So 
we said that for present purposes, we think it's significant that the consequences of the notices in, notice in question fall at the less drastic end of the scale, with the result, the court said, that there is no overwhelming argument in favour of rigid formality. The court also considered uh, the question of the extent to which the recipient of the notice uh, would be prejudiced by any, um, by any error which had been made. The court said that the fundamental question is, if a particular formal requirement is not complied with, is the would-be recipient prejudiced in a practical sense? If there is in fact no prejudice, the court should, in our opinion, be slow to hold that failure to comply with a formal requirement is fatal. The court said that is so even in cases where the purpose of the notice is drastic, as with a notice invoking a break clause or an option to purchase. Um, if there is no prejudice, the court said, insisting on strict compliance for its own sake serves no useful purpose. Now, Bearing all of those uh, comments in mind, uh, I think you, you, can, you can begin to see why the court, uh, or how the court came to the decision it came to when looking at the notice um, in, this, uh, in this case. Essentially, the court decided that, I mean, here, I, I, I've already mentioned, the court noted that this was not a type of notice which was at the sort of more drastic end of the scale. Um, it is um, very much, uh, you know, it was a notice that was intended to give information, uh, it was to intimate a, a claim to the other party. Um, so against that background, uh, and, and with the sort of purpose of the notice in mind, um, the court decided that um, the requirement to mark the letter for the attention of a specified person was of limited significance. The only purpose of that, the court uh, found, was to identify the agent within the, the particular firm who was in a position to deal with the letter. The contemplated recipient was the firm, not the specified person. Uh, uh, the court also noted that there was no suggestion that the sellers had been prejudiced in any way by the failure to mark uh, the notice for the attention of the specified person. So the court decided the failure to specify the correct person was not fatal. That did not invalidate the notice. As regards the method of delivery, the fact that it had been sent by DX, um, again, the court noted that um, Firstly, the letter was in fact received by the firm, and again, there was no suggestion that there was any prejudice to the sellers by the fact that it was sent by DX and not by one of the specified methods of delivery um, uh, in the contract. Um, so uh, again, the court felt that that, was, that should not be something that, 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 that should invalidate the notice, again, against the background of the, the, the contractual context and the purpose of the notice. The court also commented that DX was a, a system of delivery used in the legal profession, and accordingly, um, in the court's view, uh, it amounted to personal delivery within the terms of the shared purchase agreement. So that, that's the court's reasoning um, in relation to this case. Um, but looking to apply that to the sorts of notices which um, would commonly be served under a, a, a property contract, I, I think I would... Um, I think I would generally urge, urge people to regard the case with a little bit of, of, of caution. Um, as I say, I, I think the, the decision was very much uh, based on the particular circumstances of the share purchase agreement, which was an issue, and the, the type of notice and the purpose of the notice uh, that was served. And it was against that background and in that context that the court um, came to the view that the errors which had been made were not fatal and did not invalidate the notice. More often than not, in a property contract, the, the type of notice in issue will be one which has more drastic consequences, like, for example, a break notice, or in the Western Barnshire case, a rent review notice. Um, so strict compliance is more likely to be called for. So I think the overriding message here is, um, you know, if a contract specifies particular methods of delivery, if a contract says that it has to be addressed to a particular person, comply with those requirements, because otherwise you are running the risk. Uh, that your notice will be um, validated. So whilst the HOE international case maybe does suggest a, a degree of latitude, um, you know, I, I would be very, um, I'd be very wary about, um, you know, taking a, 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 a kind of a less strict approach when, when framing notices. Um, I think it's, it's fundamentally important that, um, uh, that any requirements which are specified in the contract or, as I say, in any statute which applies, are uh, compliant. One other comment in relation to HOE, um, just I mentioned earlier, you might be wondering, well, how, how does that fit with the Western Berkshire Council case? And the court did um, comment uh, on that. But essentially, the, the, the court's view was that the errors uh, which were made in, in the notice in the Western Berkshire case um, went beyond just kind of mere misspelling, and actually they were um, quite fundamental, particularly because, um, you know, the, 
the addition of a word such as, you know, Dumbarton in brackets in the name of a limited, limited company can be significant if companies in a group have the same basic name but are distinguished from one another by changes such as that. So the court was of the view that, that in HOE International, that notice, that, that the facts of that case could be distinguished from the Western Barnshire case. So as far as the court is concerned, Western Barnshire was correctly decided. I do wonder whether if Western Barnshire was being decided now in light of HOE, whether the decision might have been different. But um, if the decision does stand, um, and again, you know, I would say the overriding message here must be comply with requirements of the notice. So in terms of some of the sort of key things to take away from this, um, some key pointers to bear in mind, um, I think, um, you know, as I've just said, you know, fundamentally important to make sure that you, you know what the relevant documentation says, know what the relevant uh, statutory provisions uh, say, um, and that any requirements which are set out there are complied with, both in relation to what has to go into the notice, uh, but also um, uh, how the notice has to be served, and in particular, bear in mind any timescales, because if you don't comply with the requirements of your contract or, or statute, or whatever it happens to be, um, I think you're running a pretty significant risk, very high risk, that um, the notice is going to be invalidated. As far as contents of notice are concerned, Stephanie, any points yeah, that you would... I think the key thing looking at the Tyco case is really just to make sure the notice does what it's intended to do, um, make sure that the content is complete, it's accurate, it's, it's as clear and as unambiguous as possible. You know, make sure that if there are minutes of variation, ensure that are, these are included when you're defining your lease. Um, any documents are properly referred to, um, make sure any definition of a property reflects the premises that are leased and that you are trying to serve the break in relation to, to, to avoid any ambiguity like in the Wars and Cycle case as to which premises notice uh, relates to. The basic things like check for any errors and typos in the content of the notice. Don't just look at the body of the text, look at the headings. Look at the bits and bolts. Look at any defined terms. Make sure that they're correct. Um, it sounds really simple, but we've seen in some of the cases that we've discussed today that whilst a typo or, or some sort of error might not render notice invalid, depending on the facts and circumstances. And as Dan said, is that it's really important to get it right first time, so that you haven't got to try to rely on the reasonable recipient test as, as they had to in Manai and in Tycho, and have to go through expensive litigation, which obviously we we all want to try to avoid. Thanks, so, um, hopefully that's been useful. Um, if anybody does have any questions that they would prefer to ask to us, our contact details are on the screen there. Uh, copies of the slide will be sent out afterwards. Um, so just picking up on questions that have come to you. One question was, oh, it might, might be useful to just pick up on. Um, Conscious that it is after half past three, so uh, sorry, half past one. So I don't mind if uh, people want to sign off. But uh, it might be useful to just pick up on one of the questions which has been asked, which is if notice is to be served by recorded delivery uh, in the contract, what happens if the landlord is foreign and recorded delivery does not oper operate? Now that's a good question um, because um, obviously if it says recorded delivery, um, that is what must be used, and, 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 I, and I guess there will be circumstances where um, that is what has to be done. Now clearly, uh, if, if if the landlord is foreign and recorded delivery doesn't operate, there's, it would seem to me that there's perhaps been some error uh, in the drafting there. And that's the sort of circumstances where actually the approach taken by the court in HOE International might, might come to your aid um, and, and that, that actually you might find that actually using something which is akin to recorded delivery, like you know international, um, sign, international, sign yeah, international yeah. sign for, something along those lines, um, you know, which is akin to recorded yeah. delivery, you might be okay. You might be okay. I mean, obviously, the circum it, would, it would have to be looked at in the circumstances of a particular case and the contract in question, the purpose of the notice, all of the sorts of things that the, the court was talking about in HOE International uh, would have a bearing on it. But, I mean, a note of caution, I did, there was a case a few years ago um, where th this, this was kind of an issue. It, wasn't, it didn't involve a foreign uh, company, but it was an irritancy notice. And some of you might know, um, I mentioned earlier, that irritancy notices need to comply with relevant legislation. The relevant legislation provides that an irritancy notice has to be served by recorded delivery. Um, and uh, there was a case where uh, there had been a postal strike, um, so it couldn't be sent by recorded delivery, um, and, and the landlord um, served it by sheriff officers instead. Mm -hmm. 
and the court held that that was invalid. Yeah. It was not valid because the, le the, the statute said recorded delivery. Um, now, there it was a statute. It was provide, you know, it was statute. There wasn't a foreign element. Um, circumstances were different, but um, I think that does kind of show that there can be circumstances where, even though it, ca it can't be done, the contract says that. I mean, I would hope to think that if your contract says recorded delivery, it's clear that that's an error because actually it's, it's going to a foreign company and it it's can't, you can't use recorded delivery. Yeah, I, I would hope that, as I say, sir, doing it by international registered post or something like that would be okay. I, but I think practically speaking also, in that circumstance where I might see it arising is if there's a UK landlord and if there's some sort of assignation, or a sale that takes place and there's an assignation or something like that. Yeah. And that, I think that's on a more practical side of things, it's picking up at that point if there's a minute of variation that has to be drafted to make the lease effective, essentially, yeah, yeah. Um, rather than getting to dealing with it after the event, when you have to actually serve the break or whatever it is, whatever it is mm -hmm. it's dealing with it at the time of the sale or the assignation to make sure your, your lease provisions are effective still. Yeah, indeed, yeah, and I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I think that's the fundamental point here in relation to this, it's actually, it's, actually, it's not about the service notice to actually get it right when the, when the contract is drafted, and if it's going to be served at a foreign company, well, actually, do you want to specify recorded delivery? Um, you know, and, and this is the sort of thing that actually needs to be thought through when the contract is being drafted. Okay, well, hopefully that's been useful. Thanks for uh, joining us, um, and uh, hope to see you at uh, or uh, hope you can attend uh, future uh, webinars that we have as well. If you have any feedback, uh, also please let us know. Keen to that and indeed if you have any questions. Or any topics that you'd like to see us cover in, in future webinars. Indeed, any suggestions for future topics. Always uh, yeah, helpful. Always welcome. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks.